Coming up on Theater Talk. Sometimes you go to the theater, and um, I, for one, my heart sort of drops when you come into a theater and you see a sofa facing you, and uh, you know some people are going to come into this room, smoke some cigarettes, and behave, you know. <laughs> theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. We grow up. It always happens. Nothing is forever. That's the rule. Everything ends. And so our story begins. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Susan, so you know, there is a wonderfully imaginative and inventive play on Broadway now called Peter and the Star Catcher, which is about um, Peter Pan by way of J.M. Barry uses these wonderful old Victorian it's a theatrical prequel techniques. It's Peter Pan. Yeah, it's ab absolutely terrific play. It was written by our dear old friend Rick Ellis, who is back with us on Theater Talk, bringing along with him someone who is <laughs> making his debut appearance on Theater Talk, one of the great, great actors, Mr. Roger Reese, who has directed this terrific play, Peter and the Star catcher, well, and both are nominated for Tonys. Rick for two Tonys. Well, you know, yeah, the other so one. <laughs> as long as I was there, I yes, figured, that's you right. know. <laughs> what's, wait, what is the what, you're, Peter and what else? Um, uh, they're uh, in a in a uh, an interesting uh, quirk of this particular season. <laughs> there uh, there were two plays included in the category for best score. Oh right, One Man, Two Governors, and Peter and the Star Catcher. Wayne Barker uh, is uh, our, our brilliant composer, and uh, I happen to write the lyrics for the songs that are in the play, so. Um, uh, therefore, my uh, my my double nominee oh. nomin nominated. It's double nominee sounds like a the medical diagnosis. Yeah, <laughs> I, it's just it's, it creeps me out a little. And bit. And we should say that uh, Rick and Roger have been uh, partners for a long time. Is it impossible to live with the, this guy with his two Tony Award nominations? No, I tell you what's scary was the the you know, um, and it truly is enough to be nominated. It's a it's a it's a the cliche of all times, isn't it? But it's just jolly to be in the group, you know, and uh, for people to notice what you do. It's uh, delightful, and you know, we're not not ever defined by one thing that we do. So it's uh, but it's very nice that people notice as you go down the road somehow. And, and you, you're a Tony winner. I am oh, a Tony Nicholas winner. Nicholas, that's yeah. right. I won for best makeup in 1930. <laughs> 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 a All right, category that's no longer, in, uh, no longer you know, right. in competition. Uh, now, I, uh, Rick, I know you're a big, big J.M. Barry fan, as I am too. Is that what got you thinking about creating this? prequel, as Susan calls it, to Peter Pan? Uh, well, first, let me just say, I think prequel is a very good word, Susan. Thank you very much. I, regardless of Michael's uh, aversion to it for some reason. <laughs> it's a jargony word. I, I, well, well, maybe. But well, I don't know how else you convey the spirit in which Peter and the Star Catcher the, is. The, 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 uh, the term du jour uh, is, seems to be an origin story. Oh. Or, oh. even trendier, a reboot. <gasps> oh, God, I think I prefer prequel more and more right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. For, for people our age, it's a prequel. A An um, origin story. Oh, I, right. You know, I, it, it, as much as I love J.M. Barry, uh, to be honest, uh, Roger and uh, Alex Timbers, co uh, the co-director. Alex Timbers, the, the co-director of uh, and, and Tony nominated uh, uh, co-director of, Peter and, yeah. of uh, Peter and Starcatcher, uh, were, were uh, developing uh, this novel written by um, Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson, um, uh, which is uh, a... Uh, uh, an origin story of, of, of how this boy becomes uh, the, the character we know as Peter Pan. And um, uh, this novel was being developed by Roger and Alex up at Williamstown Theatre Festival when Roger was running Williamstown, and Alex was up at Williamstown developing what would become Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. Mm. And, um, and Roger and Alex were working with, working with the novel, mm. and they did a workshop uh, up in Massachusetts, which uh, the powers that be came to see and thought enough of to want to take it to another workshop. And for that workshop, they needed some text because the directors had determined that the actors would be adults and that the story would have an adult sensibility. And the novel is written specifically for with kids. a young reader in mind. Right. So as a friend of the family, um, they said, would you write some stuff for the actors to say? And I did. And to that workshop, Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson were in attendance when they heard it. Dave Barry said, who wrote that? That's not in the book. And I sort of, you know, edged to the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, it's funny. So then I edged back into the room. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Tom Schumacher from uh, Disney Theatrical uh, uh, said, uh, uh, did you like it? Uh, and Dave and Ridley said, yeah. And he said, well, uh, Rick's going to write the play. And somehow that's how I got the gig. What I love about the direction, um, Roger, is you, you draw in these wonderful old Victorian 
theatrical technique. So the, I mean, you've been in the theater a long, long time. Not that long, I would say. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, were you, were you aware of the, the, the sort of history of these kind of theatrical I think, yeah. techniques from your English background? I think that's true. I, I think people are, are wrong to, uh, um, but sometimes people sort of rather cavalierly say, oh, it's pantomime or it's British musical or thing. It isn't that. It's much that we recognize, much that we've all done before. But, uh, but put together, they become kind of really useful tools, uh, like um, uh, simple things like sticks and ropes are used to uh, designate and delineate an area. Mm -hmm. um, um, but this is not anything new. Uh, no, no one actually flies in the play. There's no wires <laughs> or anything. But it's true to say that at one point, a boy, for the first time ever, Ever in Broadway history, actually flies through the air at one point in the air with, with, with no sustained wires. by nothing at all. Yeah. You know, just by jumping no and trusting his friends. Yeah. Uh, and uh, jumping and trusting your friends is the history of the theatre of all time, really. That's what we've always done. That's the, the simple things we like. And uh, uh, so, yes, we use a ladder to uh, put a little girl on the end, and then unseen by anyone else, the ladder's pressed down like a seesaw. Or a, uh, what do you call it in America? A seesaw. seesaw. A seesaw. <laughs> and um, that's what Shaw meant when he said. <laughs> Country friend. separated by uh, a teeter totter, don't you call it a teeter totter? Yeah, but um, uh, you well, know, th Susan, simple things she, like that. She but she's prequel. I have teeter totter, you know. please. <laughs> well, I, I'm of the teeter totter era. But we <laughs> use, I, I we use things that are recognizably, we use uh, just simple tricks like that, uh, uh you know, uh, um, uh, leisure domain of uh, conjuring, yeah. you know, using uh, someone over here to distract you while you're doing something over there. Those simple things that we sort of forgotten in the land where sometimes you go to the theater, and um, I, for one, my heart sort of drops when you come into a theater and you see a sofa facing you and uh, you know some people are going to come into this room smoke some cigarettes and behave you know <laughs> and I feel somehow that the theater is a more imaginative arena than that right. you know that the possibility of theater a blank given a blank arena is is, is a, an enchanting thing but I also love the fact that uh, with the sticks and ropes and ladders and all that you are endlessly creating ships and islands and all this kind of stuff when we have come through a time rick where you would have spent 15 million dollars to have a gigantic dragon flapping its wings above it i mean you're really moving away from the super high-tech special effects driven broadway that, that 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 we know now what's the the unlikely um m mashup of Roger Rees and Alex Timbers, really coming from different generations, different countries, different theatrical sensibilities. What's, what was fascinating to me when I was asked to write it, the reason I jumped at the chance, um, in part, in large part, was that the, their skill sets overlap in this particular way, that, which is poor theater technique. And poor theater isn't about economics, per se. It's really about um, making the most of the least. Right. And, and, and at its heart, it's about everybody doing everything. And that idea, that sort of corporate nature of theater, not corporate like a big company comes along and pays for it, but right. corporate like communism of the theater where everybody does everything, is very moving to me and, and is my background too. When, when Roger says the, the moment of flying is about a boy who jumps and trusts that he's going to be caught. What's, what's really brilliant about what Roger and Alex did is they found a way for the plot of the play, which at its heart is <clears throat> about discovering that life is better when you're part of something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. And the production is actually a demonstration of that very concept physically and emotionally for the audience to see. So there's this wonderful overlay of production and play of presentation and material that is so moving for me to watch because sometimes you can write something and someone comes along and has their own idea about how to do it and there's the wrong kind of tension. Um, you're not, you find that you're not working on the same show. Right. And here we were all very much working on the same show. And it was very lucky for me to come into it when, after the, a point where Roger and Alex were so set in their minds of what they wanted it to be like, mm -hmm. made my job easy, which was going to... It, it was thrilling, too, for me to work with Alex Timbers, who's a, gr a brilliant theatre mind. And, and I have to say, he's in Germany right now, so he can't be here. No, so and so I can say anything I like about it. He really did all the work, and Roger was just lending his famous yeah, name, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just sat there on the sofa. It was good. No, no, <laughs> but, but it's true, and we both, in a way... I tell you one, one other thing, and, and these two gentlemen won't mind me saying this either, that Dave Barry and Ridley Pearson have written um, uh, the first novel, Peter and the Starcatchers, which moves on into several other novels, and at no time do they actually really kind of meld with the origin of the, the Peter Pan story as we know it from J.M. Barry. and I would lay that all at, his, at Rick's door, which is that he actually uh, 
w brought the you know the the the, the crocodile ticks the yep. hook has lost his hand you know all those sorts of things that uh, Tinkerbell is is uh, created all those things get, make you believe that in a few years time Peter Pan will absolutely land on Wendy's window. Well, the style of the play know. too. You know, Barry James Barry used. Um, contemporary uh, references, he used anachronisms, he used puns, he used alliteration, he used low comedy, he used high comedy, he had songs. Mm -hmm. There was a real attitude yeah, sure. about his play sure. that we forget because most of us, most of us, I dare say, know about Peter Pan because of the Mary Martin version right. or the Cat or the Wrigley Dis version. Or the Walt Disney movie. Or the feature animation. Yeah. And not so much about where it started originally, which was as a play in development, in rehearsal, where some of it was formed and some of it was evolved in rehearsal, just with like Maud Adam. with Maud Adams, with Maud Adams, and yeah, and, the, and the guy who played Captain Hook originally, Gerald de Maurier, father of Daphne de Maurier, right, right, right. and um, and brother of Sil Sylvia Llewellyn Davies, who's the mother of the boys that Barry used to hang out with oh, in really? Kensington Gardens, oh, right. and and so he got the part in part to endear. Barry more to the Llewellyn Davies family, but also because of his particular essential quality as an actor, mm -hmm. Captain Hook, we now think of as being that flamboyant sort of Charles II Cyril Wick. Cyril Richard. Cyril Richard, right, I think. Right. Cyril Richard was doing Gerald de Maurier. When Christian Borrell showed up <coughs> with us in La Jolla, and we had this idea of what the part would be, in the same way that Barry dressed Hook on de Maurier, we were able to you know, in this wonderful kind of Henry of Mayfair way, as Tom Stopper would say, we were able to tailor make this part in concert with an actor and his talent and his genius. Cut and, shape. and and our instinct about you know what the what the what the play would support, my instinct of what would be funny for the writer, and we were constantly evolving the thing. It was very, very exciting evolution, as it was with Celia and the role of Molly. Yeah, well I thought <laughs> I, I thought Christian Borrell, my co star on the hit NBC TV series Smash, um, <laughs> yeah, <of course. laughs> you've you seen but Christian game. but Christian is wonderful because Christian does put you in mind of the Cyril Richard kind of style of just gigantic, fabulous, flashy, hammy, look at me and you're going to have a great time with me jumping around up here. I, I, we're immensely proud of these 12 actors. You know, they're, they're all of them writers, musicians. They're very complex and in-depth people. And uh, I'd even cite uh, Adam Chandler Barad, as, 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 who plays Peter, who is not hands on hip wearing green tights and a, and a, and a, and a red wig and freckles. He's this very modern, uh, s strange, kind of interesting young man who uh, kids today can actually relate to completely. He, 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 you know, and we're also very an pleased actor with who's, that. He's an actor who's incapable of being dishonest yeah. on yeah, stage. Yeah, You know, um, uh, I, I just real quickly say that um, I, I wanted uh, also as a, as a guy to be able to write a part like the girl hero in the story and, and um, sort of base her on the DNA of characters like Scout Finch and Joe March, mm. um, Anne of Green Gables. Oh, yeah. the, the, the characters that I know women my age were really turned on by when they were girls and who felt empowered by characters like that. And I thought I would love to be able to write a really strong, central, empowered, super smart, super curious Spirited. girl character Spirited. who would be the hero of the story. And in La Jolla, I had screwed up and written the boy in the wrong way. And we had a great actor out there playing the part that I wrote, but he was, um, the, he was a hero from the very beginning. He was Peter Pan, mm. except without the pan. But he, yeah. he was called Peter, and he was the ringleader, and all the other boys looked up to him or were jealous of him, and one of them sort of, you know, was, was, was protected by him. And, um, and between La Jolla and New York, one of the great things about the Page to Stage program at La Jolla is you get to really workshop a play and understand it better, and you're never under any pressure in terms of press coming and feeling that you were running out of time. Right. And, and the big lesson that we learned was that the character of this boy needed to begin somewhere very different from where he needed to end up. It sounds sort of rudimentary. Yeah, now, I was going to say, I was, this sort of the standard way you do a play? The but I'm just not that, I wasn't that smart. I wasn't that smart. <laughs> and, 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 and so suddenly, Adam Chandler Barat became the ideal person to play this thing. And that was, in fact, when we changed the title. We were Peter and the Starcatchers out in La Jolla, which is the name of the novel. Right. And um, we dropped the S not because we didn't have any money. We dropped the S, <laughs> we dropped the S because um, at the point where I realized how to write the boy, I realized this was a story about this boy and this girl who become what they are at the end of the play because of the accidental, accidental meeting of... Uh, that, that uh, their accidental meeting and what happens to them over the course of the evening. And so the play could be called Boy and Girl or it could be called 
Peter and Molly, mm -hmm. yeah. but instead we called it Peter and the Star Catcher because at the end of the play, the boy becomes Peter and the girl becomes the Star Catcher, and that made the dropping of the S sort of a fundamental um, uh, alteration for us. I think what we've experienced is a wonderful kind of uh, uh, um, reminder that, that in the theater you should take nothing for granted. You know, you should always say, is a fellow really um, a competent, wonderful general and a wonderful man? And perhaps he's just a wonderful general and a disastrous man. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think uh, there was a point we had a long discussion. We use a yellow uh, uh, rubber glove as a bird and it makes a wonderful noise like a bird. And, uh, and as soon as it comes on, held by one of the actors, someone says, hello, bird. And the audience go, oh, that's a bird. They just know, you know. But there was a long argument at one time about this should be a puppet with eyes and wings and things. And just reducing it down to that simple thing is a, is, it seems to be essential in this sort of kind of game we're playing. I want to talk about your, your, your lives in the theater because you guys have been um, uh, partners for how many years now? How many? 30 years. Thir Re that long? I know it. it, just, I, uh, it, it, it time the, flies. The, the years have, have <laughs> flown by, flown by like decades. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Where Thank did you, you Where Thank did you guys meet? When, how, how did uh, you? Uh, outside the stage door of the Winter Garden Theatre. Uh, somewhat improbably, at the dress rehearsal of a musical called Cats. <laughs> um, it, it, Roger was in town for one uh, one, one day, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, I was uh, at the dress rehearsal of Cats because I was working at an advertising agency, Sereno Coin, mm -hmm. and I took my young intern. I was a part-time copywriter. And um, the people who were working on this show that no one had seen because it had only played in London, it was just about to start at the Winter Garden, and, and we were um, invited to go. Uh, and I brought my young intern, a, a, a young boy named Hal Luftig. You may have heard of him. <laughs> Producer of Evita. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Roger had just finished uh, making a, a, a movie called Star 80 the day before in L.A. and had flown, yeah, yeah. had flown to New York as a stopover because the day after he was beginning rehearsal on Tom Stoppard's play, The Real Thing. That's right. And um, he stopped by the Winter Garden to say hello to his friends, Trevor, Trevor Nunn and Johnny Napier yeah. and, and Jillian, uh, Jillian Lynn. Lynn. And, yeah. and he came walking down the aisle, and I had seen uh, uh, Roger the year before, Nicholas Nickleby, and had turned my, uh, uh, my apartment, which is sort of somewhat smaller than the size of your table here, <laughs> into a shrine. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and he came walking down the aisle, and I said, Hal, do you know who that is? And he said, oh, yeah, that's Roger Rees. He taught me last year when he was here doing Nicholas Nickleby on Mondays and Tuesdays when the... RSC was off. Right. Roger taught at Columbia, and Hal was one of his students. Right. So I said, "You know him? Well, when this Cats thing is over, you're gonna you're gonna introduce us." So standing, uh, well, anyway, um, thanks to T. S. Eliot and Hal Luftig. Well, what was um, so sorry. I was, yeah, we, we you know we we uh, I, I was so patient. I, I waited all the way through the, the show about cats. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, 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 I, I, and I and I was I was lucky enough to meet this tall young American in a Burberry raincoat outside the stage door, and it, it did the trick. Right. Really? That, yeah. was, uh, that was, it was, it was an instant sort of a... We, we wrote letters to each other for, for a long time, and then he came and saw The Real Thing, and luckily for me, Henry in The Real Thing, the very first production of it, uh, Henry is one of the greatest parts ever written, a, a, a play about love, wonderful play about love, and, um, and he seemed to approve, so that was kind of... Well, let me just, I, you know, it occurs to me that <coughs> the name of this, uh, I, see, I see from the, the mug on the table that the name of this program is Theater Talk. So, so, um, so I just thought I would try to say, to paraphrase Stephen Sondheim, um, uh, here's the, this is the thing. I, um, <laughs> I uh, if Stephen Sondheim wrote, I love him, I'm his, and everything, I, everything he is, and my paraphrase would be, I, I aspire to be. That is, um, a man who, <coughs> whom actors, from Judy Dench to Jude Law, adore being on stage with. Uh, a man whom I writers, whom <laughs> writers like Tom Stoppard and uh, Aaron Sorkin swear by. Mm -hmm. uh, a man whom directors like Trevor Nunn, uh, Jack O'Brien, Alex Timbers are inspired by. <laughs> a man who asks, Christian Borle and Celia Keenan-Bolger and Adam Chandler Barad and Teddy Bergman and Arnie Burton and Matt D'Amico and Kevin DeLagula and Carson, Carson Elrod and Rick Holmes and Greg Hildreth and Isaiah Johnson and, and David Rosmer to walk through fire and water, and they do gladly. And a man who, <laughs> uh, and, and a, a man who, uh, who chose 30 years ago uh, against impossible odds <laughs> to, to make a life with me.
<laughs> wow. Who are you talking um, about? Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. With Marshall yeah. Brickman? Is that <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, is there anything more to say there? I don't know, Roger. I think we it's, should talk. Uh, I'm dumbfounded. I'm gobsmacked. <laughs> uh, no. T uh, uh, that's English for dumbfounded. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm fascinated by your, your really great career. Um, how did what, how did you get involved in the theater? Why did you fall in love with the theater? What's you know, uh, 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 I was uh, an art student uh, in the days when you really couldn't be. I, I remember uh, my father had to sign some forms for me, and he died pretty shortly after. He never saw me act, mm. uh, but uh, he didn't really understand what I was doing. As an art student, he you know he was a policeman, he was a man's man, I kind of very much. Um, and it was, uh, it was sort of hard for him to, yeah, to understand, but I, I went to art school. I knew I was good because people stole drawings from my portfolio. So I, <laughs> I had a sense that I was pretty good. And then I went to the Slade School of Fine Art, and my father died in the third year I was there. So I started to paint scenery all around the country in Great Britain, uh, which, I, which I'd done in the vacations before that. And I, I'm a really good, I can paint scenery. Uh, and, um, uh, and I was working at Wimbledon Theatre, in South London, a beautiful Victorian theatre, um, where I'd worked a, a, a little bit time before that as a stagehand on a production of Peter Pan with Donald Sindon, who I oh, acted well, with many years fabulous later. Fabulous Donald. London Insurance you did. Right? Yeah, who taught me everything. I, if I know anything about comedy or anything, or listening to an audience, I got that from Donald Sindon, fantastic. And I was painting a back cloth of a, a toy shop from Babes in the Wood, alone in the theatre one afternoon, empty theatre, empty, and, and Arthur Lane, who was one of the great last actor managers of all time, walked across the stage. He had a wooden leg by this time, so I guessed he was down there because I could hear this rather funny. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at, oh, Mr. Lane, what do you want? And he's, he's a, he was an actor manager. Arthur Lane ran that theater for years and years with Audrey Lupton, and, and they did a different play every week, and he said, would you like to be in a play the week after next? <laughs> I was 17 years old, and um, I was so flattered, 40 foot up in the air, I said yes, and uh, I've never painted scenery since. What was the play that he put you in? Uh, I was played the lead in a play by Stanley Horton, a play that Laurence Olivier loved very much called Hindle Wakes. Wakes means holidays. Mm. So one of, it's the first, um, uh, uh, first play about female uh, liberation. <clears throat> this uh, young uh, son of a mill owner in uh, Lancashire, uh, uh, gets the, uh, a young girl pregnant, and he he wants her to go away and hide the baby, and she refuses. It's a wonderful play by Stanley. And you got Horton. the lead for your. I played the lead. Your first time. On and stage. I was much. I was the. Be I've never been as good as I was in that play as I remember. <laughs> you know what? It was extraordinary. With no and he paid me four pound a week for painting scenery, and I got three pound a week for being in the play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Why he was a good producer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. There's something wrong with that. And you had no stage training at all. I mean, is it not just, at all. As soon as, that Not first time you walked out in front of an audience, was there fear? Was he just wanted a boy? You know, this was Arthur Lane who did this thing. I think I might have told you this before, but he um, he did a different play every week, and he always played the father, whatever the play was. And he everyone else would sort of rehearse a bit, but he would just tear up the Samuel French script and leave a bit on the coffee table, a bit on the uh, mantelpiece, <laughs> a bit over there by the window, and he'd go, "Oh well, I see the vicar has been here." <laughs> <laughs> Go to the mantelpiece <laughs> uh, today. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that is so much better than what they do now, where they put the earpieces in, in people's uh, hair and cover them up with the wigs. <laughs> well, isn't there a story about the earpiece where the actress, very famous actress, I Mary Martin, yes, something, yes. and says, and says, um, "Well, I must be leaving you now. Move to the piano. Pick up the shawl." <laughs> <laughs> She's speaking her stage to <laughs> to the piano, pick, pick up, up the show. No, I'm thinking the Mary Martin one, but she was doing <laughs> Legends out of town, yes. and they gave her an earpiece, and it unfortunately was picking up um, taxi cab dispatches. Oh, no, really? Of her unfortunate. Lives. She started giving destinations. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, <laughs> well, uh, might be a way to go Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> we, uh, we can offer both things in the theater now. Big Absolutely big. hilarious. Uh, um, all right, well, uh, the play is called Peter and the Star Catcher. Uh, a wonderfully imaginative, uh, very moving, and, 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 and very funny uh, uh, play at uh, what theater are you guys it's at? It's the Brooks Atkinson Theater where we play eight shows a week. <laughs> and uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful theater. Movie. It looks so great now, the show. Yeah. yeah and which you're actually, nominated for how many Tony? We're nominated for nine Tony wow. Awards, which, contrary to some of the advertising you might see, is more Tony Awards than any play this season, which is something that I like saying before June 10th. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute, contrary to the advertising, you are one of the great ad men of all time before you got into this gig writing for sure. Yes, you know, yeah. I, Aren't I, you in charge of your own ad campaign, Rick? No, he's I, a writer I, now, I, right? I, believe it or not, <clears throat> I, I forgot about that. <laughs> no, no, the advertising is in the hands of people who are now much much more expert than I ever was um, it's it's the it's uh, it's just a it's just a 
a thing I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Ellis and Roger Reese. Uh, the show is called Peter and the Starcatcher at the Brooks Atkinson Theater. Thanks a lot for being charming guests. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank both of you. I Thank thought he was going to propose marriage. That's what I was waiting for. I was oh, getting God. very, very. I know. Uh, I thought oh, that was the week to do it because yeah. Obama went out on the limb, and I thought I would climb out after him. Follow that trunks, me. Get me to that island. Get to the island, Peter. Don't let that trunk out of your sight. Swim on against the current. Swim on against the sea. Though the tide may turn against you, those who strong the tide may be. And though your arms be led, slice him through the spray and flow. Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>